gender and sexuality are often taught together. Um, I don't know that this is necessarily a good or bad thing. Um, it kind of makes a little bit of sense, but increasingly sexuality is moving into its own realm of inquiry that's being not divorced from gender, but um, it's um, sort of becoming a distinct area of empirical and conceptual inquiry. So one of the things that we're going to do when talking about sexuality is relate it to the insights that we generated about gender. Um, uh, but that's not just because sexuality is tied to gender, it's because those are gonna be general insights that we draw upon for lots of other things that I'm going to lecture about. So I'm going to ask, how is sexuality socially constructed? Just as we asked, how was gender socially constructed? And I'll ask in later I'll, um, uh, lectures about how race is socially constructed. Well, think about how sexualities are intersectional. So the ways in which our experiences of race, gender, and other social relationships influence our own personal understandings of sexuality. And we'll ask how we regulate sexual expression within a society. And the regulation of sexuality is one of the primary things that organizations do in a society. If you think about what religious organizations do, one of their primary functions is the regulation of sexuality. Families have a deep interest often in the regulation of sexuality in either limiting the sexual expression of people, of providing opportunities, and even peer groups participate in this. So if you've ever heard the phrase of a wingman, the idea there is that a peer group is, seeks to facilitate sexual opportunities for people. In this sense, your sexuality is not just something that you have, it's something that you do, and often something that you do with peer groups, with other kinds of people. With that in mind, let's begin to think about the creation of sexuality. Um, and what I mean by the creation of sexuality is, is gonna be like a set of different perspectives. Um, one of these is mine, so you'll see my name here on the, the slides. This is because this is based off um, a, a book that uh, I edited that um, someone draws upon some of my work in this section. Angela Barian is the person in this here. But um, uh, we'll think about how it is that sexuality is not a natural thing, but something driven both by biology and by society, and that it is a social construction. So in some of my own work, um, I've challenged the idea that's been advanced in particular within LGBTQ communities and by some activists that people are quote unquote born that way. Now, the idea here um, in my challenging of this framework is to say that there is likely some biological influence upon sexuality, but that sexuality like other categories of interest is most likely is a social construction. In other words, it's determined both by some biological conditions, but also by the environment or institutional conditions. And examples of this come from thinking about how it is that expressions of sexuality vary in time and place. And so what we think of today as homosexuality or the LGBTQ community, it's sort of a unique conglomeration in the United States of understanding sexualities. Other nations, other parts of the world have a different understanding and other temporal periods have had different kinds of understanding. Like gender, we should think about sexuality as a social construction. So it's not necessarily something that's natural. It's something that is taught to us and that we express through a range of performances in socially acceptable ways. So this also draws on the work of Hubbard to think about how it is that sexuality is a social construction. So you can have change over time. Sexual behaviors and expression like gender change over time and are not entirely the same across culture. So um, you can think about the ways in which men and women as erotic beings emerged in the second half of the 20th, 19th century. And how in 1892, where we first see the term heterosexual, it helps us understand that heterosexuality is not something that people have always understood. 
Um, and in fact, the original coining of the term heterosexuality, it's very interesting, um, suggested that heterosexuals were perverts. This is from 1892, so keep that in mind, because they had non-procreative sex. So initially, the concept of heterosexuality was one that said these heterosexuals are people who have sex without the purpose of pro procreation, and those people are perverts. Now, this is something that we would not adhere to today, most of us, but it suggests an understanding that heterosexuality is a social construction, and what heterosexuality means has changed over time. My point here is to say that just as with gender, we shouldn't deny the biology of gender or to deny the ways in which there are biological differences, but we also need to recognize social influences upon that biology. With sexuality, we should take the same kind of perspective. Or in other words, we should understand the ways in which sexuality is socially produced in different contexts and in different ways, and that sexuality is not just the social production of people who identify as gay and lesbian or homosexual or queer or whatever term it is that we choose and people choose to identify with, but it's also the production of things like heterosexuality and that such pathways for sexual expression are critical as one of the ways in which societies organize themselves. So intersection, sexuality is not just a concept of your biology of whether or not you were born gay or born straight, but instead exists within an intersectional matrix. And notions of sexuality are deeply rooted in culture and have political consequences. What do we mean by this? Well, scholars have noted the racialized stereotypes of sexuality. So, for example, returning to the work of Dorothy Roberts, which I spoke about in um, an earlier lecture on gender, Roberts talks about the different tropes of uh, women, um, and in particular black women, in relationship to their sexuality, and points out how it is that black women have been highly sexualized in their cultural representation. But there are other racial groups as well that experience this. Here, the image that you see on the screen that says, finally, a cold Latina, is a play on the idea the cultural stereotype that Latina women are hot and fiery and passionate. And this says, oh, finally, there's one that's cold, not so hot, not so fiery, not so passionate, but instead cold, maybe refreshing. This is a sexual stereotype that's ethnically founded. There are similarly cultural stereotypes about Asian men in the United States. Those cultural stereotypes are tied to historical experiences. So the desexualization, or what's re sometimes referred to as the feminization of Asian men, has, at least according to the work of Mei Nai, some historical foundation in the experience of Chinese men in the 19th century. And what Mei Nai points out is that there were many Chinese men that were brought to the west coast of the United States to help with a range of projects, which included in particular the building of railroads, but lots of different infrastructure projects that were part of the colonialization of the west, the removal of native populations from those lands and the settling of those lands by primarily whites. But Asian labor was imported in order to help with this task. And that labor was imported in patterned ways, which is to say that men were provided with um, visas and allowed to come in. Women were relatively restricted. And that was partially so that those Asian men would leave after they'd done labor. They wouldn't be able to find sexual partners, particularly with Asian women, and would be forced out. But that those Asian men were also allotted particular kinds of tasks so that in labor camps, Asian men uh, performed tasks like cooking, opening things like restaurants or just cooking around a camp, and laundry. And to this day, there still is an association to a degree with Asians and laundromats and Asians and restaurants and cooking 
in um, um, throughout the United States. It's not as strong as it once was, but it still has a certain strength to it. Mani points to these early 19th century California and other West Coast work camps where people were performing labor and that the higher wage labor was performed primarily by white men and these other forms of labor that were deeply feminized, deeply feminized insofar as cooking and doing laundry were seen as feminine tasks, were performed by Asian men who received lower wages. This then is used as a way in which to interpret Asianness and sexuality. And so in part, the feminization of Asian men is tied to this historical experience that structures in ethnic ways, understandings of sexuality. Stereotypes about sexuality then can be rooted in historical traditions. Though they are rooted in history, to the extent that they persist, they help rationalize and perpetuate social, economic, and cultural inequalities. We also see the ways in which black men can be hypersexualized. Black men are hyposexualized in terms of understandings of their anatomy and their physical bodies, but also in the ways in which they act and interact, and that is interpreted. The idea here is not that there are inherent or natural differences in sexual expression by um, different racial and ethnic groups, but instead that there are historical and institutional ways and cultural tropes that we understand sexuality not just through the lens of sexuality alone, but instead through a lens of race and also, I'll finally add, class. So we might ask, and I want you to ask yourself now a question, how is it that masculinities are understood for working class men, that is men who are laborers, versus elite men? Think about movies and other representations of working class men versus elite men. Often elite men are presented as slightly effeminate, as having a delicacy to them. By contrast, working class men, insofar as they do often um, work with their physical bodies, are seen to have particular kinds of bodies and thereby particular kinds of sexualities. Sexual fetishes end up being tied to these assumptions that are racialized and classed about different kinds of sexualities. So sexuality then is not just our identity and the natural ways in which we are born with a particular kind of sexuality. Instead, it's a socially produced through a range of historical and institutional and organizational phenomenon sense of one's own sexual expression. As I said in an earlier lecture, drawing upon the work of Dorothy Roberts, sexuality is the subject of a deep amount of social control. And the way in which we enforce normative expectations through social interactions, values, and world, worldviews and laws is a central aspect to the control of sexuality. So sexuality has long been medicalized. And examples of this would be erectile dysfunction is mentioned, um, uh, but also there's a medicalization. So um, I'm sorry, the, the idea of erectile dysfunction is that there's a way in which people's sexuality is seen as being something important that medical institutions intervene in. And it's not just that things like Viagra and other forms of uh, erectile medications exist. It's also that women have been associated with and even diagnosed with things like frigidity. And that either means that they're unwilling to have sex or that they're not caring enough for children. And this requires medical intervention. This medicalization of sexuality provides a framework of understanding. It helps us see what is important to us. So the fact that we have erectile dysfunction medication means that men's capacity to have sex in particular ways is seen as something important that we should intervene in. What is normal or abnormal? Who is and what is responsible? for that performance, and what is the best way to solve this medical problem? So women who are frigid with their children are seen as abnormal 
or having some kind of problem. This is in some ways a gendered and sexual ex ex set of expectations that women should be kind and loving, which is a performance of gender that we're demanding of people. And in particular, in terms of women's willingness to have sex, that women should be willing to have sex. And if they're not willing to have sex, there should be some medical intervention that makes them more willing to do that. So the equivalent, for example, women's equivalent of Viagra. The framing of sexual issues is a form of social control. It seeks to enforce certain sexual behaviors and sexuality relative to our range of worldviews. So how we understand sexuality seeks to structure people's experiences and produce people as particular kinds of sexual beings. And one of the most important ways in which societies do this is through sexual education and sexual socialization. Sexual education are the ranges of formal education that we provide to young people about their sexuality. And there are huge fights in the United States, in particular, over sexual education. One of those fights is over the difference between abstinence-only sexual education versus comprehensive age-appropriate sexual education. Instructors in abstinence-only education are forbidden from talking about condoms, except to note that they can fail. In other words, so uh, instructors provide information um, uh, about contraception only in certain instances of sex education. So here, Think, I want us to think for a moment about what kinds of sexual education people receive. You can think about this cross-culturally, or you can think about this in different contexts of families versus schools. In general, the sex education that we provide to young people in the United States is, from my perspective, fear-based. It's often about the problems of sex, that is, unwanted pregnancy or pregnancy, and then the problems of having children at young ages, as well as the challenges of sexually transmitted diseases. So often sexual education is really a sexual diseases course that tells you that if you have sex, you're going to get sick. You're going to need some kind of medication. This approach based in fear is a way of constructing and controlling people's sexual expression. By contrast, there are other ways to think about the the, the social construction of sexuality, which might be to convey to young people that sex is an important part of their life. It's going to be the way in which they connect with some of the people who are most important to them. And so they should think about what they want from that life and be educated within it. There's also a deep drive to biologize sexual education. So in the United States, often sex ed involves things like being instructed about the role of ovaries and fallopian tubes and the uterus as biological phenomenon, so that instead of talking about sex as a social relationship between people, we talk about it as the distinctions of what the different anatomies of people are. It's not that such anatomy isn't important, but it seeks to silence sexual expression as a mode in which people interact with and connect with one another. I would know, just importantly, that actually rates of sexual activity in the United States are declining. That is, young people today are having less sex on average than their parents did. And that the age at first sex is increasing just slightly. So it's not like they're having sex at earlier ages. And so, you know, one of the things that we might ask is why this is happening and how it is that we're organizing a range of things around sex, from how we educate people about sex to how it is that we organize sexual opportunities and how none of that is just natural consequence of people's biology, but instead a set of institutional and organizational arrangements that seek to structure sexuality in a particular way.